I am really not a professional genie. <laughs> I am not very good at giving boons and all. Archie said, but at least one boon, if you cannot give three. Then genie said, well, I did not really complete genie school. And so I did not perfect the art of giving boon. I might be able to give you one boon, but whatever I give to you, I will have to give to everybody else. She said, I don't care. You give to everybody else, but I want. I said, what do you want? He said, you make me a millionaire. But a genie said, you know what you are asking. I will have to make everybody else also a millionaire. He said, yes, yes, no problem, you make me everybody else, but you make me also okay. That genie said, okay, it's a task too. He was a Hindu genie. <laughs> <laughs> so he made Archie into a millionaire. So Archie thought, well, what you are Now I'm a millionaire. I don't have to do anything, you know. Now I just go to Hawaii or Tahiti or somewhere. So he sat in his little telopi and he said, I'll head for the airport. When he looked at his fuel tank, he realized it was empty. So he had to stop for gas. So he pulled into a gas station and he asked, he said, fill it up. And then he looked around in that gas station, there was nobody because all the attendants became millionaires also then. Who will fill gas? So he came out and filled it himself. And he drove to the airport. And there was nobody to check in there. Anything. They all became millionaires, they all went away. Pilots, all attendants, pilots, all workers, everybody. Why do you stay there if you become millionaires? <laughs> So by that time, everything had caught on, everybody had gone. So when he came back, he was frustrated, you know, drove out on the street. All police officers, gone. People who operate traffic lights and everything there, gone, nothing. So there was chaos everywhere on the street. So the idea is, if you remove poverty, you see the pairs of opposite what? Affluence and poverty. If you remove one side, you remove poverty from the world, then there will be chaos. The world requires both to run. Two must be there. You know, no bicycle can move forward with one pedal. Have you seen? A bicycle with one pedal. How are you pedaling? You have to have two pedals. So, <coughs> By law, you cannot remove one side. If you try to remove disease here, disease will pop up there. If you try to remove poverty here, poverty will pop up there. The world has both of them by, by rule, by law. Fundamentally, the world is structured in that way. And when the Rishi saw this world, after Analyzing this world and realizing that you cannot have. That's why you see your life. Kabi dhup, kabi One day sunshine, one day darkness. One day sukha, one day dhup. And once you subscribe to one, you better be sure that the other one is coming. From that type of world, there is only one proposition given by the Rishis. That thing called a Mukti. That is, that is why the Shastras are given for this thing called as Mukti. You stay in that world, you better be prepared for both Sukha and Dukha. Life and death. There, there is no life without death. I mean, nobody likes death, isn't it? We always don't like one, 
One half of the pair of other. We only like the other half, isn't it? But you can't have. You can't have the cake and also eat the cake. So the proposition given by Rishi is in this Upanishads, that's called the Mukti, that is the goal, to come out from both the pairs of opposites, to transcend the pairs of opposites. Sukhan, Tukhan, all we have to find the middle. The middle part is actually the Mukti part. Between the pair of opposite. And that Mukti is the goal, goal to achieve. And the means is called as Sadhana. And there are various types of Sadhana, I told you. So, the satna which we are seeing in Bhagavad Gita is really thinking, reflecting, contemplating, ruminating, doing vichar so that we can remove the wrong ideas in the head. It is not a physical type of satna. You know the, the situation in which the Bhagavad Gita is cast is there something went wrong in Arjuna's head and Bhagavan has to remove that thing and replace it with something. Right, isn't it? It is a, a replacement uh, job. Replacement, you can be knee replacement and also the replacement over there. Yeah, no, they have, to, they have to remove something from Arjuna's mind. Wrong understanding, wrong knowledge, wrong that, and replace it with right knowledge, yes, right understanding. Like that. Huh? So, and you have a very short time to do it also. And really, I told you yesterday also, all human problems really is in his head. Even if something manifests at the physical level, that had its origin in our head. Like suppose my body is unhealthy. It is because I did not have proper understanding and so I went on eating unhealthy food. So there was lack of proper understanding, lack of proper uh, understanding about life and nature and prakriti and all so many things and I went on eating on a healthy food. Lack of proper understanding of it, this body and how it works and what it, what is, what it requires and all of that. So because of the lack of proper understanding, I had wrong lifestyle and the wrong lifestyle manifested as disease at a level, physical level. Everything starts right in our so the Upanishad tradition really is rectifying the defects in the, the mind. There's nothing more than that. So now we are seeing this eighth chapter where Arjuna starts by asking Bhagavan seven questions. And Bhagavan also now answers those seven questions. Briefly he answers the first six questions. And then Last question, he answers with the rest of the chapters. He goes into detail. That last question, Bhagavan Arjuna asked, he said, Prayani Kale Chakatam Yeo How can I know you at the time of death? Now, see, in the beginning itself, Prayani Kale comes, time of death. Beginning. Many people say this chapter is really the chapter on the art of dying. How the Rishis are treated with every topic. So there is the art of living. You have heard that? The art of living. So if there is an art of living, see there are so many arts. Art of cooking, isn't it? Art of studying. Art of living, art of cooking, there is also art of dying. But why would we want to perfect only the art of living? Because death is part of life. So I have to perfect also the art of dying. So therefore, Bhagavan takes a whole chapter to deal with this question. How can I know you at the time of death? Because, really, knowing, remembering, thinking of Bhagavan, the Lord, or the reality at the time of death is really the art of dying. In other words, we have to die in such a way that we never die again. 
Otherwise, Punarapi Jana, Punarapi Mana, Punarapi Jana, Jatare Shale. No. Again and again, but again and again, that. Again and again, like in some room somewhere. Yes, I'm sorry, all the static. Very difficult to cross over this ocean of samsara. So the art of dying is to die in such a way that I never have to die again. That is the idea. And dying in such a way means what now? Dying in such a way means that last moment I should remember the reality. Remember supreme being. That is dying. That is the art of dying. Remembering that supreme being at last moment. <coughs> Question Arjuna is asking, however, is how to do that? How to do so the chapter is centered on how to do that, how to remember that Lord at the end. Now I told how to remember well only what we have remembered throughout our life we'll remember when we reach there. We cannot hope to remember all worldly things only in our life, and then in the end. When it is time to die, then only you remember God. I mean, you can try that trick and it may work for one person. Mark is a blow, you can it. So it works, I told you, the, ex the exception is already gone. Ajamila was the exception. Because every rule has an exception. Ajamila. You know, that principle is very strong, you know. If we remember the Lord or call his name in the end, I heard of a nice story. On Muslim family, Muslim family, he was walking in Vrindavan, around a corner. And as he turned the corner sharply, sharply, from the other side, a pig was coming. You know, Muslim people don't like pig. Pig turned and he turned on and from opposite direction and there was a crash. And on those corner, street corner, they have what they call a culvert, a concrete piece like that around the corner. But they crashed into each other and he fell. And when he crashed into that pig, the natural response is haram. Because haram, that thing is cursed like that. Eh? And he fell down by saying that and his head hit that culvert and he died. That fellow went to Swarga. Swarga. So Indra Dev went and complained to Bhagavan. This fellow came to Swarga. How did he reach there? So Bhagavan said, when he was dying, he called my name. <laughs> He said, what name? <laughs> that fellow, when he was dying, he said, Haram. He said, but Haram, Ram is there now. <laughs> so he, he said, my name. He said, but okay, Prabhu, but he did not even know that he said your name. He said, he did not know, but I knew. <laughs> so the idea is, by any which way, yena kena prakarena, by hook or crook, if we say the name of the Lord at that time, we will. By hook or crook, doesn't matter. If we know or we don't know. Also. So, that is the second exception I put. <laughs> <laughs> Why I am telling you? See, in all of this traditional literature and everything, we learn only of two exceptions. We, really, we don't hope that we will also be an exception. So now we have to follow the sadhana which is given here in the eighth chapter. Bhagavan says, Remember me at all times. Means you remember me at all times. Yudhyacha means actually literally we fight the battle is telling Arjuna. Right? That means whatever you are doing, remember Bhagavan. Throughout your life, 
Only then, at the end of your life, will you be able to remember that, Lord. This is the principle. Huh? Don't try to circumvent the principle and all that thing. And the one who is trying to outsmart the Lord, anybody who is trying to outsmart the Lord, he himself only gets outsmarted in the end, you know. Don't ever try to, oh, no, 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 I will think about all worldly things and do all worldly things and in the end, I will remember Bhagavan. I, I, I will outdo the, the principle. I will smart the Lord. It doesn't work. <coughs> Once I went to remind him, Prabhu, isn't it true? A million years. It's like only one second to you. Prabhu said, yes, million years, nothing. Like one second. Isn't it true? A million dollars is like one cent to you. Prabhu said, yes, million dollars. Like one cent, nothing for you. He said, Baba, give me a cent now. <laughs> Baba said, wait a second now. You <laughs> just wait one second. It doesn't work. Huh? Because the Lord always knows. Yes, always. He, he had the last laugh. So, we have to remember. Sarveshu Kalishu. At all times, throughout the life. We spend remembering the Lord, only at the end we'll be able to remember. And he says, Mai Adhikitamano Kuthi Mame Vaishyasi Eva Eshyasi Asam Chaya Ha. There is no doubt that when you, in this way, if you are thinking about me all your life, you have actually given your mind and intellect to me. That is the meaning of thinking about me all your life. At the end, certainly you will come to me. Right? Now, the question is, how to do that? Everybody asks these things. Eh? The question people always ask, Samji, how to remember Bhagavan's whole life? That we will deal with today now seeing number eh? eight, that will be, isn't it? Abhyasa Yoga Yuktena Abhyasa Yoga Yuktena Chitasa Nanya Gamina Purusham Devyam Yati Parthan Chintayam Yati Parthan Chintayam This word is the most important word in Satana. It is the first word of that verse. The word is Abhyas. Please do not ever relinquish this word and do not take it lightly. This is the most important word in every department of life. Can you be a good cook without practice? If you want to play an instrument, anything you want to learn in proper handwriting, that can happen without practice. You name a, a, any department of life where this word is not important. And it is a very, very strange thing that human beings, in all of these worldly things, you know, we practice music and practice tennis and practice batting and practice writing and practice reading and practice all sorts of things we practice, right? In our life. Because we want that goal, we practice. And when it comes to sadhana, he wants the goal without practice. Isn't it? He want he take that mala and he goes and do, does one mala, 108 beats. He comes back. So I'm seeing nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> he does one mala and says nothing happened. He doesn't remember when he had to get his degree, how much of work and practice he had to do, and that degree also it worth nothing. Isn't it? Degree guarantees anything or what? Degree guarantees? Any number of degrees guarantee? Nothing. It, a person who has 10 degrees is more happy than a person who has no degree or what? No. It doesn't guarantee. That person who has 10 degrees, 
you will get same sickness and diseases like a person who has no degrees, isn't it? You will get same with disappointments and all things like a person who has no degree. You get same sorrow and everything like a person who has no degree. You will have the same insecurities and same, you know, it's, what, what it guarantees? Nothing. And how much of practice he put for that? And how much of effort and how, like that he put to get that thing? Which, which actually guarantees? Nothing. And then for this sadhana, he doesn't practice anything. So Bhagavan uses this word several times in his Bhagavad Gita. Sapyase has come to hear, there's so many places. So this word is the word which answers the question how to remember Bhagavan at the end of the life. If a pyas is not there, we may might as well. Okay. No. He says, Apyasa Yoga Yutena Chitasan Nanya Gavina. Chitasan Nanya Gavina is a, is a clue to understanding Apyasa Yoga. Apyasa Yoga word now, let us see. Bhagavan Shankar has already described this Apyasa Yoga in 6th chapter. Apyasa word. He says, Chitta Guma in the mind. Chitta Guma in the mind. The feel of the mind. What? Sama, sama, samana, pratyaya, avrittihi. Now there's a simple definition of abhyas. What is that? You take one thing in the mind and go, on, go over that thing again and again and again and again. That thing is called as abhyas. How simple? That's what we do. See the people who I, I uh, was having Yagnya at some place, you know this uh, recent uh, retired cricketer from the West Indies, his name is, name is Shivnarayan Chandrabha, that name you remember? Shivnarayan Chandrabha, he was sitting in the audience. So at the end we had a little talk, I am very much interested in how all these people become such great cricketers and great, you know, world class cricketers. Oh, world class anything. So I asked him, I said, you please, I am interested in your childhood. When you were a child, what you used to do? He said he used to sit in the classroom. A teacher is teaching there on the board. But he used to look outside through the window at people playing cricket. <laughs> teacher is teaching there, but he's looking outside. And as soon as the school is over, he used to go there and take a bat and ball and get, get hitting. In night time, and he hit some wall or something, the ball will come back and he'll keep hitting. And night time will come and the place will get dark and he's unable to see that ball also, but he's still. Not able to see the ball well. He still keeps hitting. In childhood. Then he called up the ass. He said, one thing. One thing. One time I was at Banaras in the university. My next, uh, next door neighbor. He was willing to play the violin. outside lawn on a chair. Classes is to get over at 4 p.m. So come home at 4 p.m. Sit on a chair in the lawn, take a five. And midnight is still see how many of without moving. Without moving. Then how you gonna become a good violinist? So for the all the only thing we do all of this practice, this same practice is required. Chitta Bhumao Sama Pratya Avritti revolving that same thing in the mind over and over and over. So I think it's called as Abhyas. Now in this case, it's Abhyas and Yoga. But one calls this Abhyas as a Yoga. So what is, what is required? See now, in the beginning, he says, Kinta Brahma. What is this Brahma? 
And I told you that Brahma is the one existence which makes up this universe, isn't it? Sharap Brahma Paramah. So we take that one thought. This world is made up of existence only. And this thing exists, this thing exists, the space between them exists, I exist, my mind exists, thoughts exist. The thought of existence exists. Isn't it? How everything is made up of existence. And so, the one universal thing which is there is the entire cosmos is called as existence. And I am also made up of that existence. So let the mind be taken up with one such thought. And even when I am, let us say, I am working on my computer, right? My fingers exist, computer exists. Action of tapping the keys, that action exists. Where is existence absent? Existence is not absent anyway. When I do that, I am merging my individual existence in the total existence. When I do that type of practice, I am actually ascertaining recognizing my individual existence as part and parcel of a bigger existence. That thing is called as merging. That merging is called as yoga. That's why they call it Pyasa Yoga. I practice seeing my existence as part and parcel of a bigger existence. I have to be constantly aware of that. And because everything I'm dealing with is made up of existence around me. That constant awareness of that fact is the yoga. It is me merging with the violent existence. Because yoga comes from yuj, which means to, to join. To, to See, what right now where we are, nobody thinks he's connected with anybody else. Correct or not? Nobody thinks he is related to anybody. Nobody thinks he is connected with anybody. Nobody thinks that he is inseparable. I mean, inseparable from others. We think we are separate from other people. So there is this connection, this uh, connectedness. I am not connected to you in any way. That's what we feel. So to know that I am connected with everything, that is really merging, and that thing has to be practiced. Abhyasa yoga yuktena chetasa nananya gamina. Don't let this mind go to any other thought. I'm working here. This car I'm driving. This car is existence only. The road is existence. All the other beings around me. Everything is made up from the same existence. Every thought in my mind, every desire, I want to turn right. The desire is made up of existence. It exists or not? I want to turn left. Every concept, every thought, every idea, every desire, every ambition, all of it exists. So to see that existence, that existence is the same as consciousness. Right? Because sat and chit are one and same. So if you like the word existence, you use that word, sat. If you like the word chit, you use that word, no problem. Both are one and same. Everything is made up of consciousness. How? So you are in my consciousness or not? I am in your consciousness or not? And really, if you dissect me, in your mind, if you dissect me, every part of me will be something which you are conscious of only. I will be part of your consciousness. I am made up of consciousness only, in your mind. And vice versa, you are made up of consciousness in my mind. So, he said, let the mind only keep on this one thought. Not that, don't let it go here and there. Now, see, it will go. Nature of mind is monkey. Chanchala Bhima and Krishna, it will go here and there. That time also, don't get disappointed, don't get angry, don't get frustrated. The mind's nature is to go. You recognize that. And when it has gone, just pull it back. Yato yato nishchalati manas chanchala vastiram, tatas tato niyam yaitat. You pull it back, he says in sixth chapter. And you go again, you go again, pull it back again. 
What is it? Each time it goes, pull it up. Let it stay on a proper awareness of existence abounding in the universe. Again, I'm going to pull back that point. So, you now see, there are other easy way things to do also. One easy thing you can do, since you have to practice this being aware of existence, we can start by being aware of all of our, I see just now I did it. We do many actions without being aware. So if we get, you will see, right now you will be shaking, some, some will be tapping. If you are sitting in the lawn, you want to pull grass. People have all sorts of actions without actually knowing that we are doing. And we don't stop, even in dream we don't stop. In the bed also we are sleeping. Talking. And that's why we don't know we are talking also. And you have to be aware. Some people talk non stop and they are not aware. See, I, like, I, I just did. I should be that you can do whatever you want, but you should be. Awareness is so important in this part. Let the, let the body do whatever it does, but be aware. Start from there. This is the starting point. Being acutely aware of all things. So, he says, if we have to pull the mind back and think about this existence, well, I have to be aware that the mind has what? So I have to develop the, the art of being aware. Otherwise, many times you find, you find yourself, you're reading a book, whole page is over, and then you didn't really you didn't know what, anything that you read. Then again, you go back from the top and stuff. Read the mind up. Gone. Paramam Purusham Divya Vyati Partha Anuchintayan He Partha The person who is able to do this abhyas, this practice of being aware, Without the mind going here and there. Chinsa na anya kamina. That mind which does not go to other things, but being aware only of the existence around me. The one all pervasive existence. The one who is aware of it, he will certainly go to that Divya Purusha, the Supreme Vya. Now I want you to see one more thing which has happened here. It's between the lines, I have to read also. Bhagavan says, Adi Yagnyo, Ahameva, Atra Dehe, Deha Pratam, Bara, all those words, right? Bhagavan uses the first person. And Anta Kale, Cha Mameva, Smaran Uttva Kale Varam, Yer Prayati, Sam Marhava. So he's using Ma, Me, My State, and all of that, right? So he's using the first person in those verses. Suddenly, here from number 8 to 9, Bhagavan changes the first person and he says, Paramam Purusham Divyam, the person reaches that Supreme Purusha. That Supreme Purusha. So he leaves the first person, he that the person reaches me. He leaves that and the person reaches the Supreme Purusha. Now what it means? It means Bhagavan himself is that Supreme Purusha. It's there between the lines. Uh, in other words, he is equating himself with the Supreme Purusha. He is the Supreme Purusha. And in, in, in this Gita, when you study, you realize he does that in many places. When he makes an equation, the equation is between the lines. In the 13th chapter, in the beginning also, when he equates Kshetra, Kshetra Gnya, he, said, he says, in this body there is a Kshetra Gnya who knows the Kshetra. But then he says, in the next verse, Sarva Kshetra, I am all the Kshetra in all the bodies. So he equates Jiva with Ishwara, like that. He makes equation many times. So here also now he's making an equation between Krishna, who is talking to Arjuna on the battlefield, and the Supreme Purusha. So the person reaches that Supreme Purusha, a part and why? Because that is what he has been thinking all along. Now, there is one more thing. If the person goes on doing this abhyas and being aware of the, 
all pervasive existence of which I am a part. If he does that, in this lifetime itself, here itself, while living, that person will attain what they call it Jeevan Mukti. Jeevan Mukti. Now, if a person has attained Jeevan Mukti, all of this, which chapter which is going on here, this becomes of no relevance there after. Because it says, for one Shankara Chaya, there was a go in the night. Vignate Pipareta Tve, the person who knows this reality while living here, is that the Shastras become of no, no use for that person. Well, if you if you have achieved the goal, if you take your car to come here and you have reached here, right? Will you really leave the car? Outside, will you bring the car in the mandir or what? In the ashram, no, you don't bring. The car has performed its work. Now you come inside. So the Shastras have performed it, what I have attained Jiva Mukti. Now Shastra is of no. So once that reality is known, then all of this. So that means to say what? These verses and this Shastra is for us who are not Jiva Mukta. So if there is any Jiva Mukta sitting here, please go home. <laughs> this is for Jasas. This is for people who are not. Jivan Mukta, huh? that person who thinks about this all his life, he becomes a Jivan Mukta. And no, the chapter is not necessary. So, since we are all not Jivan Mukta, we will continue to the next verse. <laughs> <laughs> now, see this is verse number 9, right? Kavim Purana Manusha Sitaram Adoraniyam Samanusparetya Sarvasya Thata Ramachintya Rupam Aditya Varnam Tamasaparastat Aditya Varnam Tamasaparastat Prayana Kale Manasachalena Prayana Kale Manasachalena Patya Yukto Yoga Balena Chaiva Patya Yukto Yoga Balena Chaiva Roar Matye Pranama Vesha Samyak Roar Matye Pranama Vesha Samyak Satam Param Purusham Paiti Divyam Satam Param Purusham Paiti Divyam Kavim Purana Manasachalena Kavim Purana Manasachalena Previous verse, Bhagavan said, he says, the person who is able to do this abhyas and keep the mind centered on that, what we call generally Satchit Ananda, which Bhagavan calls in the second line, Paramam Purusham Divyam. Divyam Paramam Purusham, isn't it? The Supreme Purusha. The one who can keep his mind on that Supreme Purusha, he reaches to that Supreme Purusha. That Supreme Purusha is now described. In this verse number nine, but he says that Supreme Purusha calls Kavim. Kavim word very nice. Very. Kavim word means omniscient. Actually, word Kavi literally means omniscient. But Man Shankaracharya says Kavim Pranta Darshanam Sarvagnyam means to say one who knows all that is past. All that is present and all that is future. They're called Kavi. So Kavi word we've seen uh, in our tradition, their word Kavi is there. Kavi means Trikala Darshi. You can see past, present, and future. Or the other way to say is Sarvagnya, he is omniscient. He knows everything. He's called as Kavi. Usually the word is translated as seer. Seer means you can see past, present, and future. Kavi. Of course, later on that got translated in Hindi language, another language, a poet. Hmm? This is the meaning of Shankaracharya gives here, Kavim. So that reality is Kavim. Kavim is second place, Kavim. It, it, it reality is Sarvagnya. Sarvagnya means all knowing, past, present, and future. Kavim Puranam. Puranam word means Chirantanam. Ancient, eternal. 
reality is purana mora also means it is old but always new what a wonderful thing reality does not get even though it is old doesn't get old human beings know that we get old it would have been a great travesty if reality also became old isn't it if god became old and old and then he died who do we trap for our but always no always new always कभी भी पुराण मनुषासी तारम नहीं नहीं इसको सर्वस्य जगत हा प्रशासित तारम कभी ना इट इज रूलर ऑफ द यूनिवर्स इट इज रूलर ऑफ द रियलिटी इज रूलर ऑफ द यूनिवर्स आई टोल्ड यू ऑन द ऑन द फर्स्ट डे हिंदुइज्म डज नॉट रिक्वायर is a one more reason and reality is called as anushasitara is the ruler of the universe now let us study that for a little bit then you will see how we really don't require belief huh? see when we let this thing go it was dumb right suppose all of humanity 7.6 billion people together we all stay here and we our belief is when we let it go it will go up would our belief make it go up no all the people used to believe that the earth was flat did that make the earth flat belief actually is of no consequence really it does Very little, except in sadhana we use it because it has some other benefits. But belief in this world, outside the world, it really doesn't do much. It cannot change anything. Huh? So now, this thing falls down, not by a belief, but by a law. Correct? There is a law. Second thing, anybody can break the law. No, we cannot break the law. You will be subjected to the law, whatever you believe, whatever you may believe, isn't it? So if you go on the top of the building and you jump, you will only go in one direction. You believe whatever you want, but you will only go in one direction. Huh? <laughs> one fellow jumped from the top of something. Then when he reached halfway, he realized he made a wrong decision. Oh, oh Bhagwan, I made a mistake. Please take me up. Bhagwan said, "Don't worry. Only your body is going down. You are coming up only." The law which said that the thing will go down is non-transgressible law. We cannot transgress the law. Now. Like that law, how many laws are there in the universe? Now, see, a law is not a matter of belief. A law is a law, and you can believe what you want. Isn't? Now, like that, how many laws are there in this universe? Well, the number literally is infinite. There's a law which says you will be born as a baby, yeah. and you will grow this way. And this, there's no law that you will be born old, <laughs> and you go this way. You could try, but it will not happen. <laughs> I mean, you could try to believe that, but no matter what you believe, that that will not happen. You are born as a baby, and you go that way. That, that is the law. Huh? So, like that law, see just now, some the doctors were trying to. I I like to ask these doctors these questions and all because many things they cannot explain also. Like one I have seen, when they give the answer, the answer. Right? The nerve cells are like this. There is a synapse of one nerve cell, and there is a synapse of another nerve cell. And the message jumps the synapse from from here to there. A gap. They don't touch. The 
jumps. That, that is wireless transmission. <laughs> that message jumps from one to the next. So he tells, when we give the anesthetic, that somehow it prevents the message from jumping to there. So I said, how it works? He said, we don't know, it just works. <laughs> we know that it works. And so the message doesn't go to the brain, so you don't feel pain. You see? So now, there is a law which says that this thing will jump from there to there. And how the laws work, and how many laws are there, and all that is required for that to work and all. We really don't. We don't know. And how insulin, there's sugar in the blood, and the, the insulin only allows this sugar to go to the cell, and so all complex things about diabetes and all. Still, studies are being done. We guess, science actually guesses for a little while, and they come up with some theory, and then after 10 years, somebody comes and tells, no, no, that's not the correct thing. <laughs> this is the correct thing. But it seemed to have been working for those years, and so we were going on, yes. But how many laws are there like that in this universe? It is literally countless, infinite number of laws, and it's governing every aspect of this universe. And see how the Earth is held in orbit, or by law only, by laws. Like travels, and this first day you say travel is in a straight line. Now they say, it bends. And they encounter some strong magnetic fields and where it bends. So, these are all the complex laws. Do you know? In Sanskrit word, Ish word, from which Ishwara comes. Ish means to rule. The literal translation, the Tatu Ish, is to rule. And rule means what? Rule only rules by law. Rule and law is one and Say, this is the law, this is the rule. So all these laws put together, which is infinite number, which governs every aspect of this universe, and which are non-transgressible and unchangeable, nobody could change them. All of these put together is called as Ishwara. And that is not a belief. Because the laws are very much visible. That has nothing to do with belief. You see again? We don't need that. So if a person says, I am atheist. I don't believe in this God and all that sort of thing. What do you believe in? Do you believe in all of these laws of the universe? Yes. You're Hindu. Because <laughs> 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 the laws work. They work or not? All the countless infinite number of laws put together is called as Ishwara. And those laws govern, and you have no choice. You, you have to follow the, the law. So, because all these laws govern, the laws are paramount. You cannot transgress them. You cannot live outside the law. You cannot live outside the law. You may be an outlaw. <laughs> and that doesn't mean to say you're living outside the law. So, Therefore, he is called as Anusha Asidara, the ruler. And it's not a belief system. This is a, this is a system which is verifiable by the laws of physics. You can see all the laws working in this universe. When the sun comes down, it gives to the surface layer of the ocean enough kinetic energy to escape into the atmosphere as vapor. It goes up and forms cloud, all by laws only. And then comes down over there as rain. So, the Lord, the Supreme Reality is called as Anushasitaram. Anoraniya, Samanusmariya. Anoraniya means is subtler than the subtlest. Subtler than the subtlest. You think, how many of us have seen these laws? You can see the law. You can see the effect of the law. The law is unseen. But if you see the effect, you know the cause. In other words, if this thing comes down, there is something which is causing it to come down. The cause is unseen, but the effect is seen. That cause is subtle. And so, that is, yeah, subtler than the subtlest. Ishwara. All the laws are very 
very, very subtle. We can see them with our eyes, but we know by Anumana Praman, the laws are very much there. They are inferred from the effect which we see. And we can see the law itself. That is the idea. I know that we are subtle that is that this subtle word is a very, very technical word in Vedanta. Let me tell you what is subtle. Sukshmatva is a technical word in Vedanta. You have to learn all of these words right, for you to really understand Vedanta in its depth. So what is Sukshmatva? Subtle. You know, we have five senses and we have an antakara, right, inside, in an instrument. There are some things in the universe which our five senses can perceive. Like, for example, this thing. You can see it. You can touch it, you can smell it, and taste it if you want. <laughs> Isn't it? Smell and everything. Five senses can perceive this. Whatever the five senses can perceive, that thing is called as gross, that is called as tool. But there are things in the universe where only four senses can perceive. There are some things where only three senses can perceive. So as you keep going like that, there are some things which no sense organ can perceive. That you're getting subtler and subtler. Like a thought. Can you see a thought? With these eyes? You can see or smell it. So a thought is subtler than this. The air in this room. You can't see it. You see? So the air is subtler. But this is the meaning of subtler. Subtler also means, so this is first meaning. But it means less sense organs can perceive that thing. Subtle also means it is more pervasive. Like your thought can go from here to Australia in a flash, but this thing can't. So that thought is more pervasive. It can go anywhere quickly, pervade more space. But if you have to take it to Australia, you have to use FedEx. Take a few days. So whatever is more pervasive is also more <laughs> subtle. The space is more subtle than air because space is more pervasive. Air it stops at a certain height, isn't it? Yes, but space goes on. So this is technical uh, word, sukshma. So this reality which we are talking about, for purusham, paramam, divyam purusham. That reality which we are talking about is Anora Niyam Samanusma. Anora Niyam is it is subtler than the subtlest thing which we know. This is the meaning. Samanusparetya, ha? The person who remembers that thing. Sarvasya dhataram achintyam. It is called as Sarvasya dhataram, is the support of all things in the world. I just told you that supreme reality is existence, and it is existence that is supporting everything in this world. Not supporting, it is pillar supporting. Reality supports this universe by being the universe, not supporting like a pillar supporting. There's a different type of support. The clay supports the pot by being the pot. That type of support. So it's called a Savasya Dhatara. Achintya Rupam. That reality is unthinkable. Reality is unthinkable. But just now we told you have to keep your mind on that reality. <laughs> Isn't it? You are seeing there. Abhyasa Yoga Yuktena. Chetasana Nanya Gamina, don't keep your mind on anything else, keep your mind on the reality. But now it is a it's achintyam. It's unthinkable. Then how I'll keep my mind on it? So that sounds like contradiction, isn't it? So what we do? We think about all the things in the world as existing. Right? This thing exists, this thing exists. This thing exists, space exists, I exist, you exist, everything exists. When we start thinking like that, our mind will become subtler and subtler and subtler. The 
more we do that, our mind is become more and more subtle. Right? When your mind becomes more subtle, the mind transcends this realm of normal rupa names and forms. And that mind merges with the existence which is really the undifferentiated existence behind the universe. Right now, the mind can only know what is called as a differentiated existence. Differentiated existence. I will give you an example. Suppose all this is ocean. Right? Ocean here. Now, there will be H2O here, H2O here, H2O everywhere. Because water is. The teacher is asking that boy, what is the formula for water? He said H I J K L M N O. What? Only you told H two. H two, not T O. Number two. So the whole ocean is made up of H two. Now there is no differentiation between this H two and this H two. So all same. Suppose over here. H2O freezes over. Two inches of H2O freezes and becomes a cube. Six sides. Right? Now, that cube is now become solid. But has it changed from H2O? No. Is nature still H2O, isn't it? And around him is what? See it? Is two. Here, he has become differentiated H2O because he's not different from the rest. But at the same time, not different because he's still H2O. He's taken a now over. Name and form. But look at the peculiar thing. From one standpoint, he's different because he's taken a now over. But from another standpoint, is he is H2O and everything else is H2. That means he's not different. So from one standpoint different, from another standpoint not different. Now, what we are seeing, all of us are seeing in this world is differentiated existence. This is existence differentiated with Nama, Rupa. This is thinkable, this is Chintya. Undifferentiated existence is achieved. You got that? So that reality is called as achieved. Aditya varnam tamasak parastam. This phrase has far reaching. It is, it, is, it is luminous like the sun. That reality is luminous like the sun. And beyond all darkness. Supreme reality which is being spoken about. Now the Aditya Varnam, you know, look here. It is self-luminous, the reality is described as. Because, see this light. Now the light is illuminating this watch. Right? So in the light, I can see the watch. If the light was not there, I will not be able to see this watch. Just like the light of the sun. Okay. Now I remove it. The light is still illuminating the hand. Isn't it? Uh, remove hand. The light is still illuminating, but not illuminating anything. Isn't it? The light is still, it is self-luminous. We don't need another light to see this. You need this light to see this. you need this light. But to see the light itself, you don't need another light. That thing, which doesn't need a second light, that thing is called a self luminous. And our sun is like that. That's what Aditya Varnam. The reality is like, the reality causes me to know my body, mind and intellect. But that reality itself is Swayam Pragat and also it is known or illumined only by itself. It cannot be 
you mean by an alarm? Some, some other thing. Like the sun is not illumined by another sun. It's nature is light. So the nature of its reality is pure awareness, pure consciousness. It is in the awareness of the reality, I am aware of other things. This idea is run very deeply in Vedanta when the sun is used for a swam prakash. Swam, the reality is called as swam prakash, self luminous. It doesn't need another thing. And the sun is used as an example. <coughs> So the reality cannot perceive itself because the reality is of the nature of awareness. It cannot perceive itself because there is no differentiation. See how this space will perceive this space. If this space is not, it has not changed itself and made itself into a perceiver. This space and this space are not differentiated, isn't it? This space has to change become a perceiver and this space has to become perceptible then only some perception can take place but the reality which is one uniform undifferentiated existence one undifferentiated light of consciousness which is Swayam Prakash it doesn't perceive itself its nature is consciousness only like the sunlight doesn't illumine itself it illuminates every other thing. Its nature is luminosity. Not that it illumines itself. Its nature is luminosity. Yes. That's why this example is given. These are all words and ideas and phrases require a lot of each other. That's why I told you our path is a path of each other. You have to go on thinking. Huh? Prayana kale manasa chalena bhaktya yukto yoga balena chayva says by power of yoga, by the power of our concentration, we shall be able to thinking of all our life. He says, at the time of death, I am supposed to bring with my mind all my concentration. Where? Rur, Mati, Prana, Vesh, Samyak. Bring all my concentration and all my awareness and my life force and everything right in between my eyebrows. Rur, Mati. See, out of dying. Now, how a person will be suddenly able to do this if he has not done his own thing? Suddenly, at the time of death, you become a magician or what? <laughs> to bring the entire pranic energy and attention and life force and everything toward Mati. Prana Avesha Samyak. Satam Param. That, when he is able to do that, that life force in his cell leaves through the Brahma Randra in the air. The life force leaves through that chakra and that person merges with reality. Otherwise, that life force leaves through any of the other apertures in the body. Encounter. And this is what is 
is what is called as Mukti also, which I told you in the first day. On first day, that's it called state of Mukti, Tatpadam, huh? supreme state. So, people do all of these things, study the Vedas to reach that state. People give up Raga to reach that state, and people follow the path of Brahmacharya to reach that state. That state is called as Aksharam. Akshara Brahma, all so many different names. So, first thing, what is given there? Study the Vedas. Study or Swadhyaya is a very, very important part of this tradition. I told you that. And the one, the tradition where study is most important, he is the one who never walks a book. And the other tradition where study is not essential, they are walk with book. You should be booked for that. <laughs> I'm not working with a book. So if you study is very essential. And in this part, please remember that. Exercise the intellect. Then Vita Raga. Aha. Those who give up Raga Dvesh. Raga Dvesh is given up to reach that state. Raga Dvesh means likes and dislikes. No. These things run throughout our life. Many parents have been Swamiji, please speak to these children. What is the matter with children? They don't want to eat any healthy food. If you give them junk food, they, they eat. If you give them healthy food, they say, eh. These children have strong lagam. They like junk food and dislike healthy food. Strong raga fish. And they do the chip doesn't fall too far from the block. <laughs> <laughs> you know that. They earn themselves have raga, beige. Yeah? Please see that. No, but I eat that food. Just, just tell me. The parents said, no, but I eat that healthy food. And it, ha it has nothing to do with what food you eat and what you do not eat. It has to do with the in, inner guna, inner guna of raga, beige. So if you have raga dvesha, the children certainly have. Please remember this, eh? it doesn't fall too far from the block at all. Yeah, I'll give you a simple example. One man, he's, he stopped me on the road. I stopped. He says, Nadi, my son, he's only 16 years old and already he's old. Please talk to him. Please speak with him. Huh? This man is telling me that. Why is he telling me that he has a cigarette in his hand? How am I going to speak to this boy now? Don't do like your father. <laughs> Raga Dvesh is something that is extremely pervasive in our human. We have so many likes and dislikes. <laughs> and with all these likes and dislikes, that becomes a big hurdle to reaching that supreme state. And you will see now, if I discover that there is existence in this thing, there is existence in that thing, there is existence in everything, my Lord, if you have a Bhakta, you say, my Ram is in everything. See, a Ram may suffer Jagat Chan. Karo Pranam Jodi Jodi Pan I put my hand together and I salute. Where is their Raga Dvesh? Anything I see, I do it. It's in my Ram only. So the knowledge has to be studied. The Vedas, Veda Veda, those who know the Vedas, they know everything is Ram. Vasudeva. Everything is Vasudeva. I cannot I have this life or everybody. That's what Bhagavan says in the 9th chapter. Samoham Samabhuteshu. I mean, the issue is still not I have no like or hatred for anything, anybody in this world. I am equal to all. So the knowledge will help us to remove this raga, dvesh. Eh? Otherwise, our mind will play tricks with us. I like eat the bainan. No, I don't like bainan. I mean, but a little bit of bainan has not killed anybody in the past. But why should I run the risk of being the first? His <laughs> <laughs> dvesh has some rational also, isn't it? He puts some rational there, but maybe I if I can run, I die. 
say it will not kill anybody in person. And that doesn't mean to say that if you discover really that you are allergic to buying that, that's a different thought. We are talking about a regular thing that you are not allergic to. You just have dress for that. Huh? That's what we are talking about. See that tomorrow. We have three more days. 